and in different places in the world. So we know that the horse has influenced history. In fact, the domesticated horse has changed history. The world would not be the way it is today if it weren't for the horse. So we're going to start off by just going back for a few moments and we're going to see, we're going to be looking at how the horse has changed civilizations and in particular has uh, enabled the growth of empires. Everyone, every culture has desired somebody else's land and place to make their land and place bigger and make them more great. And thus the development of empires. And that is true for Africa as well. But let's start off right in the beginning when domesticated horses were first domesticated. You'll recall we talked about them being domesticated in Asia on the Eurasian steppes. In, in the Bowtie culture in Kazakhstan, and those horses were small Mongolian horses, and it's natural, therefore, that the nomads, the Mongolians, took to the horses very, very quickly. And they were able to relentlessly pursue the, from their heartland up here uh, because they had the power of the horse, and everyone else was still on foot, and they were therefore able to conquer them, to conquer a neighboring powers. And they were known to obviously be wonderful horsemen. They were able to shoot uh, from the back of a, of a horse. Here you see them capturing wild horses, which must have been happening at the time. Uh, here you see a, a, a man portrayed riding backwards, in fact. And um, here it's a modern picture of a, a, an indication of a young, about a, an eight-year-old, standing next to a Mongolian horse. So this gives rise to this dual reality of horses. On the one hand, the horses bring destruction in battle. The war horses are terrifying, overwhelming the enemies. But in the wake of conquest, you get peace. So you'll remember I talked about small city-states. Small city-states are always fighting with each other until somebody gets stronger and takes over the next. And so that eventually uh, gives rise to, to, uh, to stability. Uh, but so they bring physical power and they bring political power. And this necessitate this, this, this need necessitates a close bond or relationship between horse and humans. And this is captured beautifully in this quote by Morris in a recent uh, his, history book. War makes the state, but the state makes peace. So once there is a state, a larger state, then that state can be developed into peace. As long as you stay in small city states, they'll continue fighting with each other. And this is true with the, the Romans, the, the Mongolians, and so on. So we're going to take a journey through Africa, and you can imagine Africa is filled with rich history of, of, of peoples taking over each other, people spreading from one uh, empire to the other. And of course, <coughs> the, northern st the northern countries of the world were also keen on getting into Africa because it was uh, imagined, uh, it was first exotic and it was imagined, and quite correctly so, uh, that there were a lot of riches in Africa. And so I've picked, we've picked just a few areas that exemplify this, this, this formation of states and empires and the role that horses played in enabling that. So we're starting off with the, the New Kingdom in Egypt, um, and we're looking at the 18th dynasty now, so it's the New Kingdom I'll show you uh, uh, shortly. And this was a period of ex imperial expansion. So uh, states usually also go through a growth and a non-growth state. And clearly the kings of the time, they were powerful, uh, and they were wanting to extend their world power. And just a, a, a point, because it goes hand in hand with how they used horses and how they imagined the world to be. But they, they had a, a polytheistic system where a belief in many gods and very much the afterlife. And in, in the case of Egyptian uh, the, uh, uh, poly, polytheism, they, they believed that their kings were gods, not that they became gods. Unlike, say, the Mesopotamians and the Syrians, they believed when their leaders died, they became gods. So that changed the way they also looked and the way that they began to revere and, and therefore uh, celebrate their kings. 
So we're looking at the new kingdom. You'll remember in the intermediate periods were the periods of disruption, of uh, decay, of disorganization, and that is when the Hyksos came in and took over. Uh, but then they gathered themselves together and uh, kicked the Hyksos out about a, a hundred years or so later, and the new kingdom developed. And as I said yesterday, that was when the, the, the Egyptians themselves quickly caught on to the idea of, uh, of the use of the horse. And so they developed their own chariots. They, developed, uh, they brought in um, horses from many, many regions. So in the 18th dynasty, in about, that is about 1552, 1070 BC, uh, the royal residents moved to Thebes or Luxor. And at the same time, that is when the Valley of the Kings began to, to, be, to, to grow, uh, where temples to, the, to their pharaohs um, um, were, were, were be began to be built. Interesting, I've just I've included here King Queen slash King Hatshepsut. Uh, some of you might know that uh, uh, she was a woman. Hatshepsut was the only female pharaoh. And, she, and it was a complicated history of how she came to be there. Uh, but because they, they only believed that males could be kings, eventually she called herself a king. And if you look at the, uh, the Egyptian, the, the carvings and the drawings on the, on the various monuments, you'll see how her face and her body shape changes as she pr uh, put, put forward a male image rather than a female one. Um, so Thebes had, had been inhabited before in the Middle Kingdom, in the Old Kingdom, um, and during the Amarna period, Thebes was probably one of the largest cities in the world, a population of about 80,000 80, people. So a pretty, really, really big city. One can't imagine these ancient cities so big. Um, and here are just some images of what it looks like at the moment, and just to remind you that uh, the, it, it was so famed and so revered that uh, Homer uh, in the Iliad mentions Thebes. Uh, it talks about precious heaps of ingots which gleam, and the hundred gated Thebes were twice ten score in martial state of valiant men with steeds marched through the massy gate, and that is the gate there. Now, Tutankhamun is very familiar to you. Uh, Tutankhamun was, uh, came to power at a time when, just prior to that, during the Amarna period, the previous pharaoh had uh, changed the place of uh, control and also declared himself to be the only god. Um, and so they, they quickly, they didn't take to that very well. And when Tutankhamun came into power, he, they re-established their polytheistic religion. Um, he died very young at the age of 18, probably as a result of an accident. People always speculate a riding accident or a chariot accident. But a beautiful, beautiful stuff in his tomb, and here is a selection of a few items that pertain to horse riding and to chariots. Here is a, a gold-covered chariot. I want to point out the, the wheels. You'll see there are six spokes. You'll remember when the, the Hyksos came in, they had four spokes. So obviously the six was still light, but was slightly stronger. You'll see other pictures later on where they go back to four, four uh, spokes. Um, and you see horses uh, riding and pulling, pulling chariots in various different ways. Beautiful stuff in the museum. So let's turn to our, uh, our, the, this uh, imperial expansion that was taking place in the New Kingdom. And the uh, Tutmosis III uh, was considered the greatest military commander at the time. And he was able, as any good leader, to stabilize the country, both internally and externally. And then came the Ramesside kings of the 19th to 20th dynasty, about uh, 1300 to 1070 BC. And the one that we know the best and is most famous is Ramesses II. Um, there was his date of reign, and he is remembered uh, as, as, as Ramesses the Great because he indeed did expand the kingdom. And he was, he was aggressive, he had aggressive policy, 
our expansion of power, intensive political contacts with other members of the Middle East, and he was building on his father's expansionist uh, role as well. And in order to expand, you need lots of horses. And what we find here uh, is a place called Pi Ramesses, and it's meaning the house of Ramesses, or great in victory. He had his, uh, Ramesses had his capital uh, in the delta. So you'll remember the delta there. And in fact, that's where the Hyksos had made their capital originally. So it was very near that. Um, and he made it the main base for campaigning. That was very logical because obviously you just pop over here and into Syria, up, 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 the, up the coast, up Lebanon and into Syria. And they excavated at Pi Ramesses. And after 20 years of digging, the archaeologists Manfred Bitak and Edgar Push uncovered some of the world's oldest stables. This was uh, in, uh, in 1999. What is extraordinary about it is the, is the number and size of this. It's the biggest and best preserved, stretched for 17,000 square meters, six rows of buildings that house 480 horses, um, and then other, other uh, advances, uh, l feeding troughs, tethering stones, stable floors were sloped to collect the horse's urine, which you know could be used as fertilizer to feeding the fields that fed the horses. Also uh, there were a foundry. Now, obviously, to make the chariots, you need metals, and metals needs a foundry. So this was a bronze-producing uh, foundry, uh, uh, where tons of bronze was processed in a single day, uh, almost an industrial scale of operation. And right next to the, uh, the, 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 the bronze producing area was logically a place where chariots were built. And this particular drawing comes from an ancient text indicating the types of and, and, and the engineering drawings of how to construct a chariot. Notice this drawing goes back to the four spoke again. So they were very important expansion. They were now strategically located, and he was able to push out, push out into the Middle East, and uh, he also pushed into Libya and south. But before we get to that, we, we, we want to know what, what are they like now? Well, right now, there is, uh, there's nothing on the surface that can be seen. Um, most of the larger monuments were moved to be recycled, unfortunately. So there were monuments there, but they were removed and recycled, and that is also common in history. Only later on we realized we should have kept them. Uh, they are under cultivated land at the moment, about 10 centimeters below the surface, and uh, the richness of the archaeology finds it's, it's very rich, much richer than the monuments that are above the ground. So there's probably vast amounts of areas that still could be explored and reveal amazing information. How do you see something that's below the ground that you can't see from the ground? We know there are very, very advanced imaging techniques used by uh, geologists and geophysicists and the climate uh, scientists are able to use various types of magnetometry to search the land and they look for slight disturbances of soil. Because where soil is disturbed, it has a different quality to when it's solid. So you're able to scan above and see where burials were. But of course the people on the ground 50, 100 years ago didn't have that. They were just had to use more instinct and, and find. Now one of the battles that we, we know well about is the Battle of Kadesh. Uh, where Ramesses led uh, several military expeditions into the Levant to reassert his power over, over the, Can the area of Canaan. He was very impetuous. He believed in himself and he rushed out with his chariots and his horses uh, and into the Levant. And uh, he came upon two, two, uh, um, two members of the opposing team which is, uh, this took place at, the, at Kadesh, which is right up here. So they would have had to go all the way up here. And here, the, the Hittites, were, with their capital there at Hattusis, uh, were now in conflict with the Egyptians. 
the leader of the, the Hittites was Ma Ma Muwatali, Muwatali II, uh, and this was now where the Orontes River. And the date uh, of the battle is uh, normally is, is dated to 1274, uh, and it's the earliest battle that's actually recorded because it was written down. I'll, I'll show you some of the picture. And they've actually recorded tactics and formations, and if you read up about it, they have been able to plot exactly what, who went where. But basically, he was rather impetuous. He rushed in. The Hittites were rather surprised. They were overwhelmed. Uh, but then he thought he had won and retreated, and the Hittites gathered together and rushed back again. Uh, and so in the end, um, as, this, as, this, uh, uh, as this poem that was written at the time about it uh, records the following. Uh, this is from the Egyptian side, from Ramesses' side. And then his majesty appeared in his glory, the great horse with the, who, that bore his majesty being victory in Thebes of the great stable was Maria El Sepentre, or beloved of Amun, Amun being one of the top gods. Just note, interestingly, that um, this is actually written not in hieroglyphics. Remember that uh, I mentioned yesterday that the Egyptians were writing in hieroglyphics. Um, which is pictorial. And here we, I showed you yesterday a picture when they were talking about uh, a chariot. But here it's written hieratic. Hieratic is a derived script, a simplified script, a version of uh, handwriting rather than printing. And what you can see in this beautiful uh, manuscript, there the horses at the top. And actually just before I came in, I saw another one down here. So clearly the word for horse was a horse still, a picture of a horse. And uh, the poem actually is an official record of what happened in that battle. And that is how they know where the tactics and, and the victories and the losses were. Ramesses claimed this as his victory, and he had this poem written, uh, uh, inscribed on the walls all over the kingdom. Uh, he certainly wasn't modest. Um, Abydos Luxor Karnak, uh, and in his Ramesium. But of course, the Hittites disagreed with this, and uh, they also claimed the victory at Kadesh. And in truth, actually, there was no victory. It was really inconclusive, and they withdrew. Uh, at least they stopped fighting each other. But they hadn't actually made peace, and it was 15 years later they did sign a peace treaty, the, the, first world, the world's first non-aggression pact. Uh, this is written here, it's, in, it's also in the museum in Syria, and it's, this one is written in cuneiform. Uh, remember, cuneiform was the, the, the script of the Hittites, in fact, the whole of the Middle East. And Egypt had people that could read and write uh, cuneiform. Now, these are the areas that he recorded his great victory, which was really neutral. And here you can see up here, you can see a chariot uh, and a horse rushing over and crushing his enemies there. And these are the, the wonderful sights that you can still see today. Now, but Ramesses also then tackled the south. Now, in the south, so remember, uh, Egypt is up here, and south, what is in modern-day Sudan, were the Nubians. And uh, the Nubians at this stage were crushed by him. He was obviously very successful at the time. And this beautiful mural shows all the Nubians being crushed and run over and dying uh, as a result of their conquest. So we now go to the next period, the intermediate, another intermediate period. What, what we can be sure of is this is now, this is going to another period of instability. And the Nubian kings now took over. So they rushed up from the south. And why? Because there was civil instability, civil unrest. Uh, the, Egypt had started to break up into small kingdoms again. Uh, and as soon as you start to break up, you lose your co cohesive power. Uh, and the Nubian kings moved up, moved in. They ruled. Uh, there were three or four uh, kings that are deified on the monuments in Egypt. Um, and they managed to quell the strife, they managed to unify 
Egypt again, you, Egypt and Nubia. So all the way from what is modern day Khartoum all the way to the Delta. These black pharaohs, as they were called, uh, had their, their capital up here at El Kuru. Um, and what we can find, what, what has been found at El Kuru, are the burial monuments of these particular four, four particular Nubian kings. One of well-known one is Pi, ruled from 747 to 716 BC. <clears throat> and what is unusual and was particularly note, noted in all the documentation and the inscriptions of the Nubians is they had a particular culture and love of horses, probably much greater than Egypt at the time. And, once, and, and they looked after them and cared for them. Now this can be, this can be seen on, for example, the stele of Pi, uh, done in 1725, and uh, what we're seeing on here is we're seeing horses, we're seeing the enemies now bowing and scraping before the king and his horses. The horses were yoked up, the chariot was mounted, and terror of his majesty reached to the end of the Asiatics. So, and in other words, all the way into the Middle East. Every heart was heavy with the fear of him. On Pi Steely at Gebel Burkel, the horses are mentioned 80, 18 times in relation to his conquest of the Upper Egypt. And this lovely phrase is written, it is more grievous to my heart that my horses have suffered hunger than any evil deed that thou hast done. Great love for his horses. Uh, on this uh, magnified version, uh, this individual here is King Orsakon uh, from Lower Egypt. He obviously opposed him during the invasion uh, and he was conquered, uh, but he was allowed to continue reigning as long as he paid tribute to the Nubian kings. And uh, at some time later, also Khan gave tribute of the 12 large horses of Egypt without equals in Assyria, implying that the horses of Egypt were more wonderful than the horses of Assyria. And as a result of this, Sargon of Assyria decided, well, he's, quite, he's my friend, I, I'm not going to attack. Now at El Kuru, what evidence do we find are of the horses there? So George Reisner uh, um, excavated tombs. Uh, this is the entry to one of the tombs that they found. And in, this is the inside of uh, some of the tomb uh, of Tantwe Tomani at El Kuru. And before excavation, it's quite remarkable. Uh, what they saw was no monument, no big building to direct them to where they had to dig, just these little mounds. And what were these little mounds? They were all burial sites. And they were all burial sites of horses. Um, and what you can see here is you can look down in each of them and look at this one in particular. The horses were buried upright. So, so they, dug, they dug long, narrow holes. And then there's the horse's legs down there. Um, and a lot of them didn't have heads. The skulls weren't there suggesting perhaps that they were decapitated before they were buried, but then later on others have said, no, they have found heads. Uh, what also they found at the head or at the top end of the grave as they were buried, lots and lots of beautiful beads and so on. Some of them uh, are indicated here. Now, the, the god Ra and the god Hor uh, were fused at this, at this particular stage, and they were represented by birds of prey, by eagles and vultures. Uh, and they were said the, the, the god of that time was Ra Horakti, uh, who was said to be the god of the sky and the earth and the underworld. I just want to check that that's the right. Yeah. Um, what does this symbolize? Obviously, it again symbolizes the extraordinary value they placed on their horses. 
The Eye of Horus we know well. The Eye of Horus is a protector and looking after them. So ideally it, it would have been, and you see it here in these beads, each one of these beads has an Eye of Horus. And they were buried with their horses. Very, very rich, uh, extraordinary amount of jewelry and valuable uh, uh, materials. Uh, some of them were horse trappings themselves. Some of them were just beads around their neck. Here you see some more. Uh, representing Hathor. Hathor was the daughter, uh, let me just check that, yeah, Hathor was the daughter of Ra. And there again, you can see the eye of Horus and you can see an image of her. Uh, this would have been hanging around the neck. So, incredible amount of richness was buried with horses. Quite amazing. Okay, so let's leave Egypt now and move, as we did yesterday, slightly out of Egypt into North Africa. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about the time, so we're jumping quite far ahead now, to about 200 to 100 BC. Um, and this was the time, uh, remember the Mediterranean was really a melting hot pot of activity. The, the Phoenicians were sailing and conquering. They had sent people to Carthage. Carthage had set up an empire, which then challenged Italy and Greece. Um, that resulted in many wars, three wars, between Carthage and Rome, one of which involved Hannibal. And remember, we know the story of Hannibal, who crossed over into Spain. Can you imagine doing that with elephants, African elephants, and large numbers of horses? So they took a lot of the African horses over with them. Probably Bob, Bob mixes Bob Arabians. That, that would have contributed further to the mix of the horses here. And as you know, Hannibal then traipsed along, crossed over France, crossed into Italy, got just outside Rome, and then he hung around there for 16 years. Didn't get into Rome. His horses died, his elephants died, those that had survived this incredible journey. And eventually he was recalled to go back to Carthage to defend Carthage because now the, the, the Romans were on the march and the Romans won that battle. They sacked Carthage, uh, put everyone off to pasture, the horses to pasture and the people into slavery. And at that stage, the Romans held this entire region of the world. They were masters of the world, the empire of the Romans. Okay, so now, if you're having such a vast, big empire, then what do you really need? You need very good communication skills. And horses are gonna help you with that they would help you even more if they had easy paths to go along. And as you know, the Romans then built this amazing network of roads that could carry horses, carts, uh, infantry. They had post spots on the way. They had ray stations. They had restaurants. They had sleeping places. Um, and so they were able to get their army very, very quickly to a hot spot uh, to be able to conquer wh whoever was giving them uh, a little bit of trouble. Um, so here you see, uh, and this is Erica's lovely creation, and a picture of w one of the Roman roads and uh, indicated along here some donkeys would move along bringing transport goods and the, the, the cavalry. They were pa paved loads and it's not so well known that there are lots of Roman roads in North Africa. So here we have Lepsis Magna, probably the most famous of all. Um, and the auxiliary would ride ahead as uh, screening for the army. So very well organized uh, machine, uh, deadly machine. Here's a picture of the roads uh, in Africa. You can see they went all the way from Egypt, a single road going there, but here around Carthage, uh, many, 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 many roads, uh, stretching for about 2,100 miles. <clears throat> They used the Roman roads also to bring in wild animals in, or, in order to use them for entertainment. So you remember, we, we talked about the zebras yesterday. They kept trying to tame the zebras. We, we learned that, that wasn't possible, but they did bring them into the arenas for, uh, for lions to eat. Um, they did chariot racing. There were circuses. And this was all very, very symbolic. 
of Roman power. As with any, any major power, just think of the beautiful, there are beautiful marches you see at North Korea at the moment with these amazing large numbers of people. It's just symbolic of power. Here we see uh, a, the, an imported tiger tackling a, an ass, or a, perhaps a, yes, probably an ass, zebras. Uh, this is the amphitheater at El Gem in, in, in Tunisia in the third century, amazingly well preserved. Many of the monuments and roads are much more preserved in Africa because of the dry climate as opposed to in Rome itself. Okay, so there were, there were uh, this is just showing the Hippodrome at Lepsis Magna. Uh, they would have had activities in the, uh, in the, in the, the amphitheater, but look down the side here. What you can also see is a long bare road, and that's where they ran races. So within the Hippodrome and outside the Hippodrome, races were run. And Needless to say, they recorded this activity in, in tiles, murals, all over Carthage and, and in Rome. Back in Rome, this is a, uh, on Hadrian's column in, in the middle of Rome, we see right at the top and on the walls interesting images of Numidians. Now the Numidians, let me just go back a sec, so Numidia is, is down here. And the Numidians were very powerful Berber tribesmen who had, brought, who had mastered the art of riding horses. Horses had been there a long time, African horses. And they were actually able to give the, the Romans quite a tough time uh, in terms of battling. And in fact, they won many, many battles. They had fast, mobile, quick-turning horses. But eventually, the Numidians were brought into the Roman army. And uh, here you see, depicted here, are uh, th these small, quite small African horses. So they must have been the sort of Caspian type at the time. And here you see the horsemen, clearly with the African type dreadlocks and with features on their face. So clearly they were the Numidians. So let's turn to West Africa and a little bit about West Africa now. And, and, and in particular about what, was, what happened during the spread of Islam across from Arabia, well firstly from Persia, Arabia, and then into Africa. Swept across right to the west of Africa. They didn't sweep south or didn't get beyond the south. Why? because we know now the horses couldn't survive there, and secondly, it was too wet for them. So as they swept, here are images showing uh, the sacking of, 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 of cities. Uh, they brought their Quran. This is the front of this particular Quran, absolutely beautiful artwork. They brought culture. They brought science. Uh, they brought their religion with great fervor. Um, and they brought, they, had, they brought guns as well. And you can see they're riding slightly bigger horses than, say, the Numidians. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking carefully here, but this looks to me more like an Arab, though the, the tail is a little bit down. Perhaps it was a bar. Uh, yeah? Yeah, okay. Uh, this is just a, a lovely image to, to show uh, a, a Orientalist painting again that we talked about yesterday, so, so rich and vivid and so captured by this imagery. Into, into West Africa they went where the West African culture started to merge with the Islamic culture. And you see beautiful mixes of architecture. Uh, we talked about in the West African empires, there we have one of those lovely Dogon characters and uh, this type of architecture, which is starting to have some Islamic touch as well. Now, at the time of the, of the sweep in, the, the West Africa was made up of hundreds and hundreds, hundreds, perhaps a hundred or so, small empires. The Fulani, we know about the Hausa, the Akan, Mali tribes, and so on. And they were all fighting with each other. And that was made them weak. And that, was, that enabled the, the Muslims to conquer them so easily. 
And this is another slide showing some of the types of battling they did. The, uh, covered up in full armor, even right down to the legs. These definitely look like barb horses. The rider is fully armored. You can't imagine what weight that horse is carrying, a very, very strong horse. And how long that battle must have lasted. It must have just been a minute or two rushing at each other, and then everyone is very exhausted. And interesting to think that this was happening at the time Christopher Columbus was going to America. So they were cavalry knights uh, riding into battle with shields and lances. Now, there are many festivals and traditions in West Africa that both represent the love and the culture that they developed around horses, uh, but also, uh, and the law of the land. And this is, this, the Fetchiba is, is one of them, where the horses are beautifully decorated, as are the riders, uh, and they come and they parade uh, before, before the gathered crowds at Barana in Burkina Faso. And uh, a writer wrote that it's, it's one of the most colorful and arresting spectacles, something we would all love to get to at some stage. Because it's still done today, and, uh, sorry, uh, what we see is uh, there's pomp and ceremony with leaders, emirs, the slide has slid for some reason. Um, they, they are doing tricks and uh, riding uh, races, uh, and leaders are coming in on these beautifully mounted high horses. Another one is the Durba. This is also a long-standing uh, record and a festival uh, for horse culture. And here, this one is more symbolic of the, the great Muslim festival. So we had Eid al-Fatar and Eid al-Kabir, and it occurs once a year where they've joined these two festivals together. And it is very much influenced by the fervor of Islam. But again, one sees magnificent uh, uh, bejeweled horses, riders filled with finery, doing uh, stunts and being led in front of the adoring crowds. There is a mosque in the background there. Uh, one just needs to study one of these pictures to see how ornately dressed they are. I'm not seeing the stirrups on this one, but often the stirrups, each, each of the straps, the halter, everything has done in a lot of detail. Uh, ornately dressed, and uh, again, it, some incredible symbols of power and of love. Now, interestingly, actually, it's the British that brought this back. You'll remember that the British conquered Nigeria. So they were rulers, the colonial rulers of Nigeria. And it was they that introduced the Durba, or brought the Durba back. The Durba actually means festival in, in, in Persian. And they brought it back to remind their subjects and their old emirs of their subordination to the crown. So that's a feature of empire building, that uh, an empire, a, a ruler takes over, imposes their culture, but then what happens after a while is they start to blend again. And when, and when the empire builder leaves, then you have a blend of what was there before. In Burkina Faso, they are so um, uh, in love with their horses that their coat of arms is, uh, has a horse on it, as does their soccer team, as does many other symbols. So now let's head south to the area that we are more familiar with. But let's start firstly with the Portuguese. They started being interested in Africa in about the 1500s. And, um, of course, they had heard of the, of the so-called riches of Africa. A chief Monomatapa, which he, of, of what is currently Mozambique and Zimbabwe, had a Jesuit priest called Silveira murdered in 1561. Because some Muslims, because don't forget the Arab Muslims had also come down the coast, uh, had, had him murdered because he had been told that they were, to, they were spying out the land, the Silveira was spying out the land in preparation for the, Spain, the Spaniards invading. Well, this set off uh, a reaction, but it took yeah, almost 
50 years later to have a reaction. So it was really a good excuse. In, 16, in 1568, King Sebastian used this as a good excuse to continue his quest to find the fabled um, gold in Africa. So he appointed Francisco Barreto, who mounted an army of 600 men, 30 noblemen, and 30 servants of the kings, as well as Moorish grooms, uh, to look after the horses. They brought a lot, they, the, the Portuguese brought lots of men and lots of horses. Many men stowed away in the ships because they heard that they were going to get all this gold. Here he is. There's the king. There's Barreto, the leader. This is the ship he came in. Many ships were lost on the way with everyone on them, plus all their horses. Uh, it took quite a few years to get enough men and enough ships there. The men that had got, they were waiting for the other ships to come, and many of them died as well. So it took quite a while to gather enough people to explore inland, I think about four years. They then uh, had to consult with the locals to, to find the best route to the Monomatapa. And they heard that there were routes that were uh, rife with disease and people were dying. Um, th that was an easier route. There was a more complicated route uh, that was, would have been uh, more healthy. Uh, but they were rather uh, impetuous, they wanted to get going, and so they took the unfavorable route. The route where we know there's a tsetse fly menace. And they started off in 1572 on their journey. So they started off here and they went up to Senna, which is about there. Yeah. And they marched, it's amazing, they marched in this blazing African sun in shiny steel helmets, breastplates blazing, represented here in this diagram here, in the sun, marching along the Zambezi River to search for the gold. Well, they didn't get very far because the horses started to die of Tsetse fly, now that we know that. In fact, the men started to die as well of malaria and other diseases. Well, you had to blame somebody, so they blamed the Muslims uh, and accused the Muslims of giving poison to the horses and to the men. The result was a brutal response. Uh, the, the, the Portuguese then killed a very large number of the Muslim population, saying they were avenging uh, Silvera, almost a hundred years later now. So even though they killed off all the Muslim population and the so-called poisoners, uh, the horses and men continued to die. Um, and eventually they retreated. But interestingly, it is said in some literature that Beretta, the leader, rode a horse clothed in chain mail. It seems likely. And it's reported that his horse was the only one to survive. And one can surmise that this horse was protected from the insect bites, and that is why he survived. And so they went back to the coast, retreated back to Portugal, not to reappear again in Africa. They had been trounced by the, the, the Griclas and other tribes along South Africa as well that were riding oxen uh, in battle. So now we turn our attention to more recent times and the arrival of Van Riebeck. We discussed Van Riebeck a little bit yesterday, so I won't deal with it in any in in sort of detail, but we talked about the fact that they arrived, they built a fort, Van Riebeck begged for horses, and eventually the horses did arrive in, in certain numbers. They came from Java, Persia, South America, eventually some more from Spain. And they began to engage with the local Khoisan peoples. And uh, here's a, just a lovely uh, uh, painting by Samuel Daniel uh, of the Khoisan getting ready for going on an expedition. The relationship between Van Riebeck and the other and, and the Khoisan was in the beginning, they were, they were mystified that the Khoisan didn't want to become laborers and be paid for it. They were, they were completely mystified. They wasn't mystified that the Khoisan didn't want to give them their land. And so in the beginning they tried to negotiate. It's very interesting to read Van Riebeck's journals because it indicates his confusion about this. 
but eventually aggression started to rise and then what the local population would have seen is that the horses that now were coming in were in, uh, enabling them and becoming uh, enabling them to be more powerful, spread more, take more of their lands. Well, it's natural if your land is being invaded, you're going to start stealing those things that enable the power to spread, and so they did. Um, now. I'm jumping a little bit uh, quickly. So, so that, that, that to and fro and battling between the local Khoisan uh, and, and, and the local population continued. What also happened during that time, slaves were brought in, slaves were also brought in from Malaysia, and marriages were created. And you started to get a population, what we would call a mixed race population at this stage. And in that mixed race population, the there would have been people and sons or offspring that would have started to learn to ride horses. Now, th that is important because later on, as, um, as the colonists now pushed out and they wanted to expand up the east coast of Africa, they, of course, came upon the great Greek tribes. Um, here we have the governor Janssen's meeting with Chief Geica at the Cat River and uh, obviously trying to negotiate because the, the British, which was the British at the time, were pushing up and, and, and hoping to take more land. They had horses, <clears throat> but the Griqua did not have horses at the time. This is the beautiful Kaskama panel made by Carol, who's in the audience tonight, uh, indicating um, uh, Ngaka is given a fine gray horse to maintain his boundary. So part of the deal was, <clears throat> well, we'll give you horses uh, if you maintain the boundary, and hopefully we'll develop better relations with you. Uh, but the British drive the Khoisan and the Koza across the Fish River. What needs to be said is, however, that things were becoming very confused here in the Eastern Cape. <clears throat> and the, the British were fighting the Boers the, and siding with the Khoisan, and the Khoisan sided with the, uh, the, 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 the Khoisans and, and, and so on. And everyone was mixing up, and there was no one side at the time. Here's just another lovely image, and I'm sorry, I, uh, I must have missed the, the heading here, uh, showing uh, the, the colonists pushing the Greek back across the river. Now, this lovely image begins to show that the local tribes were also now having horses. So in the frontier wars, the early frontier wars, we will find that horses were exclusively on the side of the colonists. But later on, we find that they had horses. And what you see in this picture here as well is uh, the, the mixed race group, the Fengu, um, and others riding together uh, and uh, forming parties and uh, being able to then gain more power. Um, here we have a conference, and this is now between the, the, the British and, uh, I don't remember which tribe this one was, but you can start to see that, which one? The Khoza as well. The, um, they were, you can see them now, mounted on horses, very fine looking horses, uh, and they were negotiating uh, before the commencement of hostilities. Interesting that, eh? You it's fascinating for me that wars are often like that. You agree, you meet, you agree how you're going to fight, then you go back and you fight. Um, here, this is a lovely Thomas, beautiful Thomas Baines painting where the Cape Mounted rivals and, and the Grafrenet levies attacking uh, the Khoza soldiers in Amatola in, uh, in 1851. This is also from the Iziko Museum. And now we're going to turn our attention uh, to, to, the, to the Boer War. Uh, I'm not dealing with the, the first Anglo-Boer War, um, which took place between 1880 and 1881, but we know the outcome of that war was, was defeat for the British at Lang's Neck. Um, you see the lances here. But let's turn a bit more attention on the Second Boer War. 
It was declared in 1899, and the British thought it would be over by Christmas. <clears throat> they had numbers of people, they had horses, they had power. And they were like David and Goliath. In fact, they thought they were fighting a ragtag band of, of Boers that pitched up in their scruffy clothes, and they were the great British Empire. Um, and in fact, they, the, the, they outnumbered the Boers by about five to one. Here you can just see some images of the, uh, the British going off. And here we see in, uh, on the left-hand side some of the Boer riders. Remember, the Boers were all required to bring their own horse, because all Boers were, were, were farmers and had horses. So they had to arrive with their own horses. They weren't supplied. In fact, they weren't supplied with uniforms or anything. And they also had to bring their own guns. But it became rapidly clear that the Boers were uh, much smarter than they, and they presented a much more complicated uh, 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 fighting scenario. Their tactics were different, as we know. Um, the entire Boer force was mounted. They could fight and vanish, fight and vanish. Um, they certainly, if you weren't you, you without a horse, you, you would be captured. Um, and they, of course, were exper expert marksmen. They were used to riding. They could ride from the back of their horse. And they had high-velocity bullets. <clears throat> so the conventional strategy is no longer applied. And so this resilience, this guerrilla war uh, warfare, went on and on and on much longer than, than the British imagined. This started to drain the British Empire of men, but also horses. So they had to keep bringing in horses from outside. Uh, and so they brought horses for their cavalry. And here you see them being unloaded. Um, extraordinary number. 360,000 horses out of a total of 519 had to be shipped to South Africa. Others they brought in from Namibia. There were some coming in. Possibly there were others that were here. Uh, large numbers of mules and donkeys, uh, and total brought into the region of the war. <clears throat> now, uh, let me just say briefly that, of course, what happened was these horses were not adapted. They brought them into the environment, and very quickly they sent them out to fight. Most of them didn't last very long at all. I was reading just the other day, the key thing about the adaption of a horse to a new place is the is the internal digestive microbiota uh, environment. So it's not just that the horse has to eat different food, but the bacteria that digest and break down the food have to change, and they have to get them into it. And that takes time. And they weren't given that time. And so uh, though one sees these magnificent pictures of really horses in beautiful shape, here we have the Fifth Lancers, the Highlanders. <clears throat> Imperial Light Horses, the Fifth Lancers. They occasionally slaughtered their horse for meat. Uh, for example, during the Siege of Kimberley and Lady Smith, horses were consumed. <clears throat> and they produced something called chevril, which is like bovril that we eat today, boiling meat paste, making a sort of jelly to survive. It's just some battle scenes showing the Battle of Colenso at Ilanslachter. Half a million horses, mules, and donkeys died during this conflict. <clears throat> and then th that was a number completely unprecedented at the time of warfare uh, at that time. And at the relief of Kimberley, ultimately, General French's cavalry rode 500 war horses to their deaths. He just rode them until they fell, completely unnecessary. 500 horses in one day that they had shipped all the way from different places in the world. Many animals were killed in action, but many, many more died from their wounds, from disease, exhaustion, starvation, dehydration. Uh, and the failure of British to allow them to acclimatize. Average expectancy of a war horse was about six weeks. By the way, we, the picture we saw was Port Elizabeth, not, not Cape Town. They arrived in Port Elizabeth. <clears throat> about six weeks. We end 
our story of horses in Africa with a, short, a few slides on the Basutu. Now, between 1815 and 1840, the Basutu were a lot of small tribes. As before, small tribes were weak and vulnerable. And they were sheltering as these small groups in an area of Lesotho, the mountainous area of Lesotho, to, to, to resist the onslaught of the Difaklani. Now, the Difaklani is, uh, is the imperial push by the Zulu uh, to, to, to conquer the other tribes in the area. Uh, and there was a huge mass slaughter. I'm, the figure's very big, million, million. Uh, a million uh, Africans, uh, Sutu, and many other tribes were killed during this, this uh, outrage. Uh, here you see that happening, but you also see... Ah, uh, all right, all right, so I'll pick that up, thank you. I thought that wasn't quite right, but that is, I'll come back to the zebra story or quaka story in a moment. Okay. <clears throat> now, the, the, these chiefs uh, gathered in the area, and a very wise chief was amongst them, Mushwe Shwe. And he wisely gathered the clans together at his stronghold in Tababa Posui. And here you see a lovely diagram, and you can see these beautiful uh, hilltops that we see in the northern part of our country. <clears throat> And, sorry, I meant to animate this out. So uh, there's, a, there's a very nice picture of a horseman there. Around 1830, they encountered the Griqua. Uh, and the Griqua at this stage, now, don't forget, they had horses because they had had them from the Eastern Cape. And they had guns. And this absolutely terrified the, the, the Sutu. Um, but after a while, they watched them from a distance. They, watched, they lost their fear. They, they began to understand guns. And they acquired their first horses by raiding the Griqua in the 1830s. Mishresha was a very wise and brilliant leader. And he set about then to systematically obtain horses, legally or otherwise. Um, and within a few decades, under Mishresha, they had become a nation of horsemen. Every man in Lesotho had a horse. <laughs> Uh, by, in 1875, already 35,000. By 1903, every male, probably around about 40,000 people, rode horses. Of course, women didn't ride horses then, but uh, y you, you can see uh, here, still in modern Lesotho, we do see women riding horses with the baby on board there. This, this beautiful picture of um, a, a, a Lesotho tribesman with his, with his hat that we are so familiar with. Children, they still rely on their horses, who are very hardy, very tough, very adapted to, to the environment, very sure-footed and able to deal with the food that is available on the mountain. And the money, the banknotes, naturally revere the tribesman and his horse. And so I'm going to leave you now. Uh, I've taken you on a journey through Africa uh, from old times to now. We've, we've seen horses in all shapes and sizes and festivals. And I hope you've enjoyed the, the journey a little bit. I would like to give credit to a lot of people, and I'm, I'm not going to read these all out, but particularly first to UCT Summer School, Mehdi and Fanula who invited me to speak. Uh, and I'm very grateful for them to do so. There are many assistants and helpers behind the scene. Thank you very much for helping, uh, organizing venues, organizing chairs, and so on. <clears throat> Iziko Museum provided us with a lot of, uh, lot of the material, some of which we haven't credited sufficiently. Um, William Fur Collection, Esmel, uh, Esther Esmel and Lila Hersham, there is at also at the museum, there's a Cenozoic Paleontology group of Serena Govender. We, uh, Erica spent a large time, long time in the Parliament archives where Lila Komnik uh, was there. And there's Lila somewhere here. Huh? There you are. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Lila. Um, <clears throat> rare historical information coming from Ingrid Henrici, uh, Robert Dalby, Sadek Kasuji. 
<coughs> Furthermore, uh, the Cultural Connect, Kane Briggs National Library, Melanie Thurston, Kaskama, Traff, Carol, is Carol here? No. So Carol was here on the first night, but please tell her that we, uh, we, we particularly grateful for her contribution of her beautiful Kaskama murals. Uh, the West Coast Fossil Park, which you really should visit. Uh, the Museum Africa, Kenneth Lungwani. Are there others? Okay, that's it. And then we want to leave you with a picture of the, the tapestry by Carol uh, of the Kaiskama Trust. Uh, and this shows the British return the Cape to the Dutch in 1806. And here the British go home and, and the Dutch rule for a while. So thank you very, very much. I would like to also just thank my colleagues, to Erica, to Catherine, to the cameraman for being here. And as always, I'd l I'm very happy to take questions. Yes. Yes. So the quah are actually zebras. Uh, when we started to do DNA analysis, I was involved in the Kwaha project. So uh, when we started, when they started to do DNA analysis, there were samples from the Zika Museum, but there were also samples of the last living Kwaha in a German uh, zoo. The DNA was analyzed at the time, early sequencing of DNA, and compared to the local zebras, and it was found to be a zebra. So what happened? Uh, so it wasn't a different species, so uh, or even a different breed. It was just a zebra of lesser stripes. And then, uh, so what happened is that the, the, this group um, started had the idea that they're going to rebreed them back, and they selected. They went around the country and they found all the zebras that had lesser stripes on their tail, just one or two less stripes, or just paler brought them together here on the Table Mountain, actually, which was the wrong place because the, 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 um, the vegetation is wrong. But there are some there now, but we rotate them, and they also have to get fodder. Most of them, so then they bred and bred and bred, and I think it's about fourth or fifth generation now, and you will see quachas, quachas uh, if you go to Fora, at the National Accelerator. You can just drive up there, tell the man at the gate you want to go and see the quachas, and you go into this physics facility and you'll see them there. And there are lots and lots of them have got this pale, pale back, but they look very like so quachas. Well, they, they were extinct, yeah. Well, it's probably not true to say that we know for sure what we have now is what was then exactly. But what we do know is they, they were never a different species. They were just a, a subgroup with lesser stripes. Yeah. It is said that they were slightly more docile. Perhaps the Van Riebeck, in fact, thought that they might be more tameable than others. Uh, but of course, by killing them off, we were never able to test that hypothesis. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes. Pardon? Oh, at Fora, does anyone know what Fora's name is now? Um, it's the National Accelerator. It used to be the, the nuclear That's right. Uh, but it's got a, a different name now. Yeah, it's um, got the road, Baden Powell Drive, as you yeah. cross the end to mm. Yes, it still is. It's CSRR, UCT. Uh, it is a physics facility. It's an accelerator. So it's a big, it's a building, and all the, the, the nuclear physics is going on in that building. That is what's so peculiar. It's a lovely environment. I think the reason they, um, they there was somebody on the committee of the, of the rescue committee that happened to work there. And because the accelerator is dealing with particle physics, the boundaries of this facility are very wide. So there's a lot of land that is just sitting there. That's what I'm imagining in my mind. Well. And there's springbok, and there's those white springbok there. So they brought in quite a few, and so they're completely enclosed, but in this big land. They've got a big pond. It's wonderful to go bird watching there as well. Why can't I remember 
what it is. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. You've been a great audience. I can, I, it's been lovely to watch your eyes. <laughs> Have a lovely evening. Let me. No one says no. I need to. I need to. Yeah, there's quite a few messes. Oh, you, you're this way. <laughs>